Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 16th uh, online Spintronics seminar. Thank you very much for joining us. This is Xin Fan from University of Denver. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Professor Jin Shi uh, obtained his PhD from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1994. After graduation, he worked as a postdoc research associate at the University of California at Santa Barbara, then as a staff scientist in Motorola Phoenix uh, corporate research labs before he became an uh, associate professor at the University of Utah in 1999. Uh, after 2005, he moved to University of California, Riverside, where he's currently a UC Presidential Chair Professor and the Director of the Spins and Heat in Nanoscale Electronic Systems a DOE-funded Energy Frontier Research Center. So without further ado, Professor Shi, please go ahead with the talk. Okay, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon or good evening, even good morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Shin. Okay, uh, today I'd like to share with you um, some, of the, some of the recent results on um, on a, a small subset of antiferromagnets, uh, namely uniaxial antiferromagnets. Uh, so from our experimental study, uh, so we, uh, we are able to generate and de electrically detect spin current in this subset of antiferromagnets. So I'll show you uh, a couple of specific uh, examples of the material, so iron difluoride and uh, a chromium 203. Okay, so this work, uh, as Shin pointed out, is uh, supported by our uh, Energy Frontier Research Center on spins and heat in nanoscale electronic systems. Okay, so. Okay, so here's the outline. Uh, so after brief introduction, I like to show two ways of generate spin current in uniaxial antiferromagnets. One is through the temperature gradient by so-called the spin seaback effect. So we generate a coherent um, magnon spin current and then electrically detect by heavy metals. Um, then the second way is um, to do sort of antiferromagnetic spin pumping to generate coherent magnetic spin current and detect electrically. So these are basically two main um, uh, aspects. So, uh, so as you all know that spintronics started with a, um, spin polarized uh, currents in ele electron electronic systems, right? So started with um, the giant magneto resistance and went through various of uh, innovative uh, the uh, advances uh, in uh, you know new technology, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Basically, I want to well, I just want to point out that the essence uh, or maybe the challenge of the spintronics now is really um, you know the number one is to reduce energy consumption. Okay, so. Uh, that's why um, so a lot of researchers are moving uh, away from a spin polarized currents to um, pure spin currents, uh, first in ferromagnets. So now let me switch just, just to, to some general um, uh, uh, description. Okay, so the few, uh, the spin currents, pure spin currents uh, can be um, electronic or magnetic, magnetic. So in metallic systems, so primarily electrons can generate, carry pure spin current without, without the uh, dissipative uh, charge current. So there are a number of examples. So for insulators, uh, so we have a uh, magnon, magnons that uh, carries spin current. So it can be regular spin waves in ferromagnetic uh, insulators or spin supercurrent in easy plan ferro or antiferromagnets. Uh, so there have been progresses in these uh, material systems or the uh, chiral edge spin, uh, spin waves in magnetic 
crystals. So many of the topics uh, uh, have been investigated by our uh, PIs uh, in our uh, EFRC, the Energy Frontier Research Center. So today I only uh, focus on the um, pure spin currently anti-ferromagnets. So before I start anti-ferromagnets, so in general, so spin current in ferromagnets, uh, ferromagnets can act as a spin current source. So either uh, I mentioned earlier by spin feedback and the spin pumping and in metals, uh, we, uh, uh, th this is a sort of injection, right? So spin Hall effect uh, 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 can also uh, um, act as a spin source. Uh, um, spin current source. Okay, so so everybody sort of uh, is familiar with the motivation for antiferromagnetic spintronics. So we were told by theorists that antiferromagnets, uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics can offer a lot of unique uh, attributes, such as ultra fast spin dynamics. You know the lack of uh, magnetic moment, so that uh, the interaction uh, can be through through so, um, the uh, straight field can be reduced, right? So then there's an aspect of a low energy dissipation in insulators. And uh, the theoretic review articles have been written recently, as recent as 2018. Uh, I may have missed other review, theoretical review articles, but relatively speaking, the experimental progress has been relatively um, a little compared to uh, the theoretic, theoretical advances. So uh, our work um, objective of, especially this work, is to demonstrate experimentally the uh, generation and uh, electric detection of pure spin current in antiferromagnets. So we, um, okay. So so we chose the simplest, right? The simplest antiferromagnets that it is the uniaxial antiferromagnets. So the, uh, the static properties, we, we're all pretty familiar with the static properties. So we use the antiferromagnets in spintronics, especially for exchange advice to produce a shifted magnetic hysteresis loop, right? But actually the dynamic properties are in, more interesting and potentially very useful. So uh, here, um, just want to show that uh, there are uh, uh, simple uh, in uniaxial antiferromagnets. There are two I, uh, eigenmodes uh, for spin precessions. So alpha. Let, let me just uh, use alpha for the right hand and beta mode for left hand spin precession modes. And these two modes have the same energy on the zero mag zero magnetic field um, here. So this is the energy. Um, which is determined by the exchange uh, interaction and anisotropy uh, energy. And this energy, uh, the, the, two the energy of the two modes can be lifted by uh, applying a uh, magnetic field along the z-axis. If you apply large enough field, this uh, 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 collinear uh, uh, anti-parallel configuration uh, can be displaced uh, 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 stabilized by the uh, so-called spin-flop transition when the field reaches the spin-flop uh, critical field. Okay, so this is a left-hand mode has a relatively lower energy than the right-hand mode. Okay, so uh, if I look at uh, the few known antiferromagnets and uh, compile the properties uh, uh, together in this table, you can see that, uh, okay, there, for example, iron fluoride has relatively high uh, um, the frequency, um, uh, the magnet frequency at a zero magnetic field, 1.5 terahertz. Uh, the smallest actually in this small group of four elements, uh, four materials, uh, this is a chromium 203. So it's 100, uh, 165 uh, gigahertz. Okay, so these are corresponding spin flock field and nail um, temperatures. Okay, the first part of the experimental work um, uh, is the spin feedback factor. So as I said, so we want to generate antiferromagnetic spin current um, so from incoherent magnets. So uh, in this uniaxial antiferromagnets. 
So um, these are the two rele rele relevant papers um, that I will mention. Uh, um, okay, so before our work, actually in 2016 and 2015, these two PRLs were uh, published on chromium-203 and uh, manganese uh, fluoride, difluoride. So uh, let me just briefly summarize the result on the left here um, by Seki et al. So they found that the, the spin feedback voltage is essentially zero until the easy access field reaches the critical value, which is the spin flop transition. Okay, then uh, they overlaid the spin feedback voltage, voltage uh, with the magnetic moment uh, measure in squid, I think. Then these two uh, curves essentially are on top of each other. That indicates the spin feedback voltage, which is a measure of a spin current, right? The, the pure spin current generated by heat is essentially driven or related to the uh, moment, induced moment. So you need magnetic field, not only need it, have a magnetic field, but also the field need to overcome this uh, spin flop transition to induce a uh, finite moment. So in some sense, this uh, experiment indicates that the antiferromagnet behaved like a ferromagnet uh, when you look at the spin feedback effect, right? Just, um, so you need induced moment to have finite spin feedback signal. Uh, on, the, on the right hand, this uh, iron fluoride case, um, this uh, uh, actually this, um, uh, the, the, the samples are uh, epitaxially grown films. So you see clearly there's a spin flop transition and the signal is finite uh, even, even below the spin flop transition. Okay, so there are some differences between these two uh, uniaxial, two different uniaxial uh, ferromagnets, uh, antiferromagnets. And what, what is more interesting, uh, what is interesting is if you look at the temperature uh, dependence here, there is a peak. The peak uh, at some temperature below the transition, uh, the other temperature, transition temperature, right? So, uh, so, uh, um, okay. So uh, one question uh, we had for ourselves is, okay, do we really need, do we really need induced magnetic moment? to generate the pure spin current in antiferromagnets? So this is a question we intended to answer in, our, uh, uh, in my, uh, the experiment that I will uh, talk about next. Okay, so the theoretic understanding was based on a 2016 uh, a paper uh, by Rosendi. Uh, essentially, you have uh, uh, two magnum modes as I show, uh, uh, described earlier. So under thermal equilibrium position uh, uh, condition, so you have more sort of left-hand mode occupied, uh, left-hand mode, so more angular momentum from the left-handed magnets than right-handed magnet, which is uh, um, alpha branch has a higher energy, uh, higher uh, frequency. So basically, if you sum up, sum up all the um, uh, possible magnet energies, magnet modes, so you can get this characteristic peak here that it was uh, uh, in, um, uh, in agreement with experimentally observed temperature dependence in magnesium fluoride. And this is actually the temperature field dependence. So there are a lot of um, uh, similar, similarities, similarities between the theory and the experiment. Okay, so uh, our proposition um, so to address the question I mentioned earlier is to choose a uniaxial antiferromagnet which has extremely high uh, uh, spin flop field so that in our laboratory um, uh, we don't have enough field to generate any uh, um, finite large um, fer uh, uh, magnetic moment, induced moment especially at a low temperature, right? So we want to have essentially zero induced moment uh, with, you know, 10 Tesla or so or below, right, the magnetic field. So basically we chose uh, iron fluoride, which has 
a very high uh, spin flop transition field, which is 42 Tesla. You have to go to the Magnum lab to do this, uh, to go through the uh, transition, right? The spin flop transition. Okay, in comparison, the manganese fluoride has um, a spin flop transition field between eight and nine Tesla also. So we want to basically uh, to create the situation which has essentially zero induced moment. Okay, so this is sort of a qualitative test, right, of the model, right? And uh, sort of a little bit more quantitative test is, okay, because the frequency, the uh, magna frequency in this uh, uh, iron fluoride, which is connected with the fact that, uh, you know, spin flop transition is high, right? And uh, because of the high frequency, so according to the model that I described earlier, one would expect the peak position to be located at a higher temperature compared to, uh, let's say, magnesium fluoride. So these are uh, actually uh, theoretically uh, plot, uh, uh, predicted and plotted below, right? So magnesium uh, fluoride has a peak. So the, uh, the peak temperature is, uh, you know, between five and 10 and the iron fluoride has a peak uh, at a higher temperature, right? In this case, about 20 or so, 20 degrees or so. Okay, so this is why we chose iron fluoride. So to make uh, uh, high quality films, actually um, um, many other researchers have demonstrated the potential growth of similar films. You also include iron fluoride, right? So many is fluoride, uh, iron fluoride films by e-beam evaporation. So um, because of the lattice structure, we have a uniaxial anisotropy uh, uh, the, for the uh, antiferro magnets. And we can, we grow this, uh, we grow this by MBE, um, EBM evaporation uh, in UHV. So um, uh, we control the rate um, by controlling the temperature. Uh, let me just uh, uh, show you the, um, the read pattern um, uh, 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 the, during growth, we monitor the, the growth by um, read. Okay, read pattern. So along electron beam along different directions, we show this uh, uh, nice uh, read pattern, streaky right, uh, read pattern and XRD show that, uh, okay, we have an ataxy. So iron fluoride is grown on this magnesium fluoride 110 oriented substrate. Okay, so the, um, this is for, I believe, uh, 50 nanometer or so, oh, uh, yeah, 50 nanometer thick, also thick um, uh, uh, iron fluoride film grown on ma uh, magnesium iron fluoride substrate, and the, the RMS roughness is about 1.2 nanometer, so it's reasonably uh, smooth. So to first characterize the exchange, uh, ex, uh, the anti-ferromagnetism, so we use exchange bias uh, to uh, measure the, um, the pinning. So essentially we use, uh, okay, we pattern the film. Okay, the film has a cobalt on top of um, anti-ferromagnet, uh, so iron oxide, 50 nanometer thick. So we pattern into a whole bar, we measure this uh, magneto resistance uh, so we use uh, the, the peak, okay, this two peak, so they're um, a, um, asymmetric, um, uh, asymmetrically located, right, with respect to zero field. So we can uh, plot this uh, uh, exchange bias field, which uh, is zero above 70K. So uh, at and, and below 70K, there's a clearly the exchange uh, bias developed. Okay, so we believe we identify this temperature uh, 70k also for the film being the um, anti antiferromagnetic ordering uh, at least the pinning uh, temperature. Okay, so to do the spin feedback uh, uh, measurements, uh, we have this uh, standard uh, uh, um, geometry. So with the layered systems, we have a patterned whole bar. So this doesn't show the whole bar, but the, the um, temperature is temperature gradient is generated by this top uh, uh, heater layer uh, chromium by applying current. We generated a high temperature 
than the temperature gradient vertically. Uh, uh, so through this uh, insulating about 150 nanometer thick also uh, insulating aluminum oxide layer, then this uh, platinum uh, is used to de uh, detect or measure the spin setback voltage. So here basically for different heating current currents, so we have uh, this uh, rotating uh, field in plan, so we see this uh, um, sinus order uh, response, then we can extract the uh, voltage, spin by voltage as a function of, for example, uh, power. So it's uh, expected, you know, as expected, there's a linear dependence, right? So showing that this is, uh, has also right symmetry. I'm not going through the details. Okay. All right. So now let me present this uh, data. Okay. So if I chose uh, this, uh, a different applied magnetic fields, along the east axis, so from 0.2 Tesla to 12 Tesla for iron fluoride is way below the spin flop uh, tran uh, transition field. So as a function of temperature, right, for different fields. So lowest field, we have this uh, uh, two peak, right? So this uh, one peak around 11.6 K also. The other peak is located at 70 K. The 70 K is the temperature we start to see the exchange of bias. Um, developed. So when we increase the field, this high temperature peak is gradually uh, broadened, right? This is kind of reminiscent of the critical phenomena. So when you have this uh, 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 continuous phase, phase transition, when you apply magnetic field, increase the field, then you have this broadened peak at the transition um, uh, transition temperature uh, in the range vicinity of the transition. Okay. Uh, the other field, uh, the other peak uh, located at um, 12K also stays uh, roughly the same, also same position. If I plot all the data together, then it shows um, similar um, uh, characteristics. So again, this uh, low temperature peak uh, is located around 12K also. Okay, this high temperature peak is uh, rotate, uh, located at uh, around 70K, right? So essentially it's similar characteristics uh, shown here in the select, selected, um, for selected uh, fields. Okay, so now let's look uh, more carefully. Uh, so if we just look at, focus on the low temperature peak, so this compare um, relatively well with the temperature, I mean, the spin feedback uh, voltage predicted for iron fluoride, except that the temperature, maybe, uh, maybe slightly, what we see is that the temperature at the peak is slightly lower than this uh, theoretically predicted peak, but the overall characteristic uh, is, uh, is about the same. Okay, so the reason I cannot show this these uh, these peaks alone is because uh, if I go back, okay. So these uh, these two peaks are relatively uh, broad, especially the high temperature peak. So I uh, cannot reliably separate these two peaks. Otherwise, you can view these um, two peaks are superimposed on top of each other, right? So let's uh, look at okay the induced moment. So actually, we measure the induced moment uh, along both the easy axis direction and the hard axis direction. So this overall accessibility, this over two curves, uh, sort of um, reminiscence of the magnetic accessibility um, that is anisotropic, right? But if, if I look at this temperature range here, where I see the low temperature peak, right? So there is essentially zero induced moment. There's no induced moment in this temperature range, right? So this allows me to uh, conclude that um, this low temperature peak, spin feedback peak, uh, does not originate from the induced moment, right? We can, we can say that. So we're, we're dealing with the ease axis field. Uh, so this was expected um, uh, before based on the high uh, field, um, the spin flop field. 
Okay, now let me switch to the high field uh, peak, the high, I'm sorry, the high temperature peak located around 70K or so, right? So we know that uh, um, a lot of thermodynamic quantities, including transport quantities, have the power law type of behavior. So uh, at the critical uh, temperature. So they typically show the universal behavior with a universal, universal set of exponents. So for example, um, so mean field, we have this um, um, magnetization, the beta exponent, and uh, magnetic accessibility, typically called gamma. So these two values are different uh, for different models, right? Mean field uh, versus 3D icing, this is a critical uh, theory. So um, we focus on these two, but we don't know whether uh, we should compare our measured spin feedback voltage to the induced moment or magnetic accessibility. So we don't know either, we don't know compare it with this one or the other one, right? So M or DMD, DH. So we started, we, we Okay, in order to find out which one represents our data better, uh, better, so we try both, right? Okay, so I just want to briefly mention that, uh, so the CITES group, uh, uh, they were looking for some kind of critical responses uh, in GIC uh, uh, using spin feedback, but they didn't find uh, a, a, a uh, um, expected um, uh, behavior in the power law behavior or the critical behavior. Okay, so as I mentioned, so we tried M first. So if we treat um, the spin feedback voltage uh, to be something like a proportional to M, behave like M, then first we try, uh, okay, the mean field theory, the exponent beta. Uh, 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 and gamma, the, the, this is half, right? So uh, then uh, for this mean field, uh, so we, we do this uh, um, standard scaling analysis, right? Clearly this doesn't work. Then we switch to 3D, 3D Ising uh, exponents and do similar thing, but it was a, was a different exponents, right? Then uh, clearly it doesn't work either. So, we uh, tried a different one, right? We tried to uh, compare, so um, treat, sort of treat uh, specific voltage uh, as a quantity proportional to magnetic accessibility. So in order to do that, we need to switch to a different uh, exponent, right? So exponents are used are, used, are uh, shown here. So we use a, a three-dimensional Ising model, uh, Ising uh, exponents. Actually, it, it really it worked. Okay, mean field doesn't, doesn't work either. So this tells us that, so magnetic, I mean, uh, magnetic accessibility in this case worked very well. Uh, if we treat spin, um, basically spin feedback voltage, something like magnetic accessibility. Well, from the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem, we know that this, we really, measure or we really probe the correlation of the spin fluctuations, right, the gamma. Uh, so from this exercise we see, we can sort of conclude the spin feedback actually probes, not probe directly order parameter, but an order parameter, I mean the spin fluctuation uh, correlation in, um, uh, in this case, antiferromagnetic, near the antiferromagnetic phase transition. Okay, so this is what we learned for the second peak. So the both peak, we sort of have a reasonable uh, understanding. Uh, so, uh, okay, so how about uh, chromium oxide? So uh, chromia, so chromia actually has a relatively low spin flop transition. Uh, this actually is about a six Tesla at a low temperature. Okay, so with the spin flop transition, we can induce uh, a, a mode switching from a low field that is dominated by this beta mode, which is a left-hand mode. And actually when you go over this transition, you have an induced moment. That moment will process around the Z-axis field 
So it carries right hand mode angular momentum. So when you sweep field across this spin flop transition, one should expect a sign change in the spin flop, uh, spin flop transition. Okay, so this is somewhat uh, 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 one can do with um, manganese fluoride or uh, chromium, but not with iron fluoride. Okay, so these are the um, uh, data uh, taken for uh, at different temperatures. So, um, so for at lowest temperature, we see here the spin flop transition is around six tesla. Okay, we see clear uh, sign change here below the spin flop transition and right above the spin flop transition, indicating the handness uh, switching from left hand to right hand. So this is a consistent with our earlier picture um, uh, related to magna uh, spin seaback effect. Okay, so I should have speed up a little bit more. So the temperature dependence is showing actually right here. So let me just quickly, uh, um, just this, uh, uh, the comparison with the Seki's data, uh, the uh, 2015 PRL data on chromia. So actually we concluded uh, uh, differently. So we conclude that even below the spin flop transition, we have relatively large um, uh, spin feedback response. So this is consistent with this uh, two magnum uh, branch um, uh, 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 theoretical model, okay, which does not need any induced moment. Okay, now this is uh, the first part. So let me, uh, okay, the next uh, 15 minutes or so, let me uh, switch gear to a, a, a different topic that is how to generate and electrically detect the uh, antiferromagnetic spin current uh, by using antiferromagnetic spin pumping. Okay, so this is more sort of a, a recent, uh, uh, recent, recently published uh, paper uh, in Nature in uh, earlier this year. Okay. Um, speaking of spin pumping, uh, this was uh, uh, for ferromagnets already a uh, well est established experimental tool now. Uh, essentially, every lab can do this experiment uh, using a uh, gigahertz type of uh, microwave source. Okay, so this original paper uh, 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 used uh, this uh, 9.45 gigahertz, basically excite the ferromagnetic uh, precession. Uh, uh, resonance uh, peak is uh, uh, in uh, nickel iron or any other materials can be easily achieved with the microwave. But how about the antiferromagnetic spin pumping? The inherent difficulty is this high energy, right? The high frequency, high magnetic frequency or energy. Uh, however, theoretically, it was uh, uh, predicted uh, or uh, proposed in uh, 2014. Um, so because of this, again, this familiar picture, right? So there's a two eigen uh, states. So one can actually selective, uh, selectively excite one of the two modes, essentially. Uh, but you can actually go through the resonance and uh, detect, um, uh, well, the goal is to detect electrically, right? Okay, so the first attempt was made by uh, Gunnerman's group. Uh, this was published in 2015. And uh, the electric detection uh, in the uh, electric signal, actually, they concluded that there might be some um, uh, rectif rectification effect and also the, the heating, right? The heating effect due to see back uh, 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 spirit signal mixed in the uh, resonance uh, signal. The so real inverse spin hall signal is probably less than uh, um, 10% according to, to this report. Okay, so we actually proposed, uh, the first experiment we proposed to do was in late 2016 uh, on uh, nickel oxide we actually went to the free electron uh, uh, source in Dresden and tried to excite the antiferromagnetic, uh, well, we, what we started with two magna kind of absorption process we observed in Raman, 
and we try to uh, look for similar signature around that transition um, uh, condition, right? We didn't succeed. Uh, then we came back and we analyzed our data. Then we realized that, uh, okay, the, the frequency is not really uh, correct. So we look for other materials. We found, okay, chromia has the right frequency uh, that we can be accessed by a capability that is really located in our backyard in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara. So basically UC Santa Barbara has this 240 gigahertz source, the uh, solid state source. So we can actually by a uh, sweeping magnetic field, we can hit two resonances. One is called this anti-ferromagnetic resonance. So this field is along, applied along the z-axis so that we um, intercept this point here uh, to excite right-hand uh, precession, right-hand mode, right, of the anti-ferromagnetic, the one of the two modes, right? And uh, if we keep going across the spin flop field, then to this uh, um, induced moment precession mode, we call the quasi FMR. So similar to ferromagnetic resonance, but this is a full, not fully spin polarized moment, uh, rather non-zero induced moment. So we, we will at least see uh, these two resonance mode, right? So we thought, okay, we can electrically detect these two resonances electrically by uh, using uh, humorous spin hot detection. Okay, so these are the different modes. So this is the ex experimental setup at UC Santa Barbara. So our sample basically uh, is shown here. So we use a heavy metals, like two heavy metals. We use uh, um, tantalum and platinum. Uh, as you all know that these two metals uh, will generate for the same spin polarization, will generate the two um, opposite, uh, opposite sign in the spin, inverse spin hot voltage. So this would be a nice uh, way of telling whether the spin current, I mean, whether you have a spin current or some other um, spirit signal from the circuit. Okay, so these are the parameters uh, that we use at Santa Barbara. Okay, as far, okay, the sample we use um, uh, one one minus one zero surface so the easy axis, uh, the spin actually located, uh, pointed in the plan. So this X-ray XRD showing um, well-oriented one, one minus one zero, one, I'm sorry, one zero minus one zero orientation and with a reasonable surface uh, smoothness. So we use a set of platinum um, strips connected together or tantalum connected together or we string, uh, string them together, okay, to form a really long uh, detector. So we can actually have a huge boost from this uh, type of uh, configuration in, in the signal, the inverse spin hole signal. Okay, so as I mentioned, so we have this, uh, um, uh, okay, the, we expect to see these two resonances. So use the convention of detection uh, based on um, bolometry detection in this uh, um, setup. Uh, so by sweeping field uh, to, uh, to this uh, anti-ferromagnetic resonance, to, which is located about 2.7, we do see some wiggle, right? Some feature here. Off resonance, we see flat, pretty much a flat line. And uh, uh, the same is true for the quasi-ferromagnetic resonance, we see some wiggles here, okay? So something different from off resonance feature. Okay, uh, this we know that, uh, okay, these are probably the two resonances we expected to see in the uh, in, in chromium. However, if we connect to um, the uh, electric circuit you, um, uh, using heavy metal, we see much sharper and much larger signal compared to this uh, electromagnetic resonance signal. See, especially at anti-ferromagnetic resonance peak, this is a very nice uh, uh, sharp peak. And a quasi anti uh, a quasi ferromagnetic resonance, the line shape is a little more complex. It doesn't look like a single peak, but it is clearly uh, visible there. 
compared to off resonance reciprocities. So it stands out. Okay. So now if we switch uh, to verify this is indeed from the spin current, so we switch the platinum channel to uh, tantalum channel. As I said earlier, we expect to have a sign change, right? So indeed, we have this sign change in both channels at the same, exactly the same location uh, of the field. Okay, so same, the same, the, the quasi ferromagnetic feature has also got inverted uh, if we switch from platinum to tantalum. So both signals actually are um, of uh, spin current nature, right? So we we do detect this in uh, so uh, inverse spin hall voltage. Um, one thing we okay, I want to also mention that okay, so off resonance. When you look at the off resonance uh, uh, response, it's essentially flat, except this in tantalum. There's a small um, background, which is actually if you look over the whole field range is linear in field as actually in, in tick, uh, indicating that the ordinary Nernst contribution might be responsible for this background. So otherwise the off resonance, there's no feature, right? No, no other feature. Uh, so when I say this, I, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the spin flop, but there's another feature that, but if we forgot about that feature, then off resonance, we have a flat, essentially the zero response. So indicating that the resonance features are essentially the spin pumping signal. Okay, well, how about the negative field? So here we change the detector. So how about we change the source, right? We change the source, so to change the angular momentum uh, in the source or spin polarization in the source. Okay, we sweep the magnetic field to the negative side we have here um, completed reversal of the voltage, uh, the peak voltage, right? So there's nothing else, no finite shift or anything. It's zero background and the completed reverse uh, inverted, inverted voltage signal. Okay, so this uh, two sign reversals give us the confidence that the detected signal is indeed from resonantly generated this is a magnum, coherent magnum, uh, the spin current from those uh, coherent magnums. Okay, so if we look at the complete temperature dependence, it's even more interesting. So let's start with a low temperature feature. At 2.7, as I mentioned earlier, is a negative, okay? But compared to the quasi ferromagnetic resonance, I'm here just pointing to the main feature. I think the other feature uh, is something else. So the main feature, let's say the positive, that if this is our reference, internal reference, right? So we know that this has to be from the right-handed magna. So if we say, okay, in this detection, okay, in this, uh, using this metal, uh, which is, um, oh, sorry, this is maybe tantalum. Okay, so we have uh, positive for right-handed, but here, what's, uh, what happened? We have a negative signal. But we expect to see the right-handed antiferromagnetic mode at 2.7 Tesla. But why it becomes a negative, right? You should be, if it's right-handed, this is also right-handed, we should expect to see the right-handed um, contribution, which should be positive. But if we gradually warm up to 45 degree or so, this uh, signal sort of vanishes it becomes neg negligible small. Then if we further increase the temperature, the sign becomes positive. So now if we look at the data above 45 degree, see these two signs actually agree. This uh, quasi ferromagnetic resonance peak sign agrees with this anti ferromagnetic resonance peak, which both should have some, the same handness, okay? So what happened at a low temperature? Okay, so let, from experimental point of view, we see the sign reversal. So we know that it's a spin current. So what we can only conclude is there is a handness switching, right? There's right hand, 
the left hand to right hand switching. Oh, I'm sorry. So if you cool down, you have right hand to left hand switch. Okay. So this is basically a low temperature becomes left hand dominated uh, contribution here. So what, what's going on here? So we plot this uh, peak uh, position at a resonance, uh, okay, so for antiferromagnetic resonance, we have this overall temperature dependence. You see that as we cross 45 degree, going below 45, this uh, a peak, actually you see, you notice a scale change, right? 50 millivolts here, the five millivolts uh, there. So there's a huge, uh, rapid increase in the magnitude uh, at a low temperature in this uh, beta mode. Okay, this is the quasi uh, ferromagnetic mode. It also has enhanced signal at a low temperature. Okay, so, so we uh, uh, developed a simple model to expand this feature. Uh, so we found that we have to, so here we have a rate equation for coherent magnon number or density. So this is driven by a constant uh, microwave source. So that generates uh, coherent magnons. And also we have this uh, Gilbert damping takes care of the magnon to phonon um, uh, transition, magnon to phonon uh, scattering. And we have uh, less magnons due to this process, coherent magnon. But we have to add this term. This term basically uh, describes coherent to incoherent thermalization. We call this incoherent magnon production term. So we have to put in this term to explain this uh, incoherent transition, inco and the sign change below 45 degrees. So for the incoherent magnon density, we have this uh, diffusion equation here in this uh, um, antiferromagnetic uh, slab then spin diffusion towards this interface then uh, um, uh, detected by the inverse spin call. So these two equations um, uh, generate, okay, so uh, give us this uh, inverse spin call um, uh, expression, okay, which is actually the solid fit here uh, is um, from this equation. So we, we've, uh, we think that this uh, incoherent uh, production, incoherent magnum production is really important in on the chromia at a low temperature. Okay, but why, uh, why um, the sign, I mean, not only the sign change, but the magnitude shoots up so drastically below low temperature. Okay, so we just specifically look at the pure incoherent magnum contribution. In this case, the slide I already showed you earlier Right, in this case, we do spin seaback effect. So we know that this is only incoherent uh, case, right? We only generate incoherent magnet. That means we generate both beta and alpha depending on temperature, right? We have a more, in general, we have a more beta mode, beta magnets than alpha magnet. So, but when, you, when we sweep magnet field above the uh, spin flop transition, we only have right hand magnet. So that's why there's a sign change here I mentioned earlier. But if we decrease the temperature, what decrease the temperature, we decrease alpha mode, which is right-handed mode population, right? So that means the contribution from um, right-hand helicity uh, is getting smaller and smaller at a lower temperature. And eventually when we pass this point, temperature is low enough, um, essentially all the magnons are uh, left-hand magnons. Then this caused this uh, rapid increase uh, in the magnitude of the left-hand contribution uh, of the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, the incoherent magnon contribution detected by spin sigma. Okay, I showed you this uh, uh, slide earlier. So my time uh, is uh, up. So let me just quickly summarize. So in the uniaxial antiferromagnetic uh, uh, material, uh, we picked the uh, iron fluoride, uh, which has a very strong spin flop transition. I showed there's still the magnum contribution to spin seaback effect, which has a characteristic peak 
that is expected from this uh, two magnon type of picture, right? At nail temperature or at the transition temperature, uh, we have this pronounced uh, um, uh, fluctuation. Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, related to this universal, the critical phenomena. But what we learn is that from spin feedback, actually, we probe not the auto parameter directly, rather the correlation of spin fluctuation. Okay, um, the uh, the fluctuation, uh, the um, spin pumping. I'm sorry, spin pumping. We can using anti ferromagnetic spin pumping. We can generate the resonance. I forgot to mention earlier in anti ferromagnetic resonance. Typically, you need to go to much higher frequency to excite such a uh, resonance. So it's not as easy as ferromagnetic spin pumping. But we demonstrated that uh, for the. Um, um, very clearly that uh, this is actually the spin current uh, generated. The, I mean the um, uh, the coherent. I mean the spin current uh, generated the voltage. Um, okay, so the uh, low temperature um, anti ferromagnetic resonance. There's a sign change that suggests this coherent to incoherent magnetic thermalization process, which is important uh, in chrome oxide, and the sign change of the uh, anti ferromagnetic resonance voltage is, uh, can be explained by the spin feedback contribution at a lower temperature. I, I also uh, should point out uh, uh, for the spin pumping um, in April, I believe April, uh, the Central Florida group also reported very nice spin pumping results uh, in manganese difluoride. Um, so with that, uh, let me thank my collaborators in UC, they're all in UC. Um, so R Riverside, Santa Barbara, and uh, LA. And thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take question questions. Thank you very much for the uh, nice talk. Let's send a, a round of uh, virtual applause by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. <laughs> so, um, Questions. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please use a raise hand. You can do that by clicking the participants button at the bottom of the screen and in the pop out menu. Um, it, uh, at the bottom, there uh, should be a, a function that says raise hand. Um, the first question will be asked by Dr. E. Lee. Please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself. It cannot. Okay. Okay. Uh... Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Shi, for a for nice talk. Uh, very nice talk. So uh, my question is based on the coherent and incoherent pump spin, spin pumping in your second experiment. Uh, I'm just a little bit uh, confused. So when you, when, you, when you mean, what I'm just as curious, what do you mean by the incoherent Spin pumping. So, so in your experiment, you have like a uh, 200 gigahertz microwave uh, drive onto your antiferromagnetic layer, right? And yes. then it will generate this uh, 200 gigahertz dynamics. And for the incoherent magnon generation, do you mean that those 200 gigahertz magnons will have a uh, like a generate a different? Uh, frequency magnum and then injecting into a platinum or a tantalum then converting into the inverse spin hall effect voltage and yeah, that's my question uh, it's a good question um so by um by incoherent magnums we know that there's always incoherent magnum uh, population even off resonance so you can see that from spin feedback so here um here you see the off resonance. We have um, we have a zero uh, baseline here. So if we generate a resonance, we generate resonance here. This should be right-handed, right? So so coherent mm -hmm. magnets should be right-handed. But it, instead, we see excess at low temperatures. We see excess left-handed magnets. This, this means that on top of um, equilibrium thermal magnon, you already have in the system. By, by uh, setting, by uh, sweeping field 
to this resonance condition, you generate extra, so excess incoherent magnums. This would not be possible without coherent to incoherent magna thermalization. So this okay. can, the, the detailed the microscopic process could be uh, two ways, right? So one is this magnum from coherent to incoherent scattering, right? You have yes. thermalization. Then effectively speaking, you have effectively higher temperature that generates effectively more magnons, thermal magnons, okay. but uh, you lose the coherence um, in this uh, procession, right? Uh, th there's another trivial um, process is maybe you heat up, because of a resonance, the system, the insulator absor absorbs more energy. So equivalently speaking, you have more magna at the resonance. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's I what see. I mean. Yeah. So it's like a microwave oven from uh, 200 gigahertz uh, radiation heat up the sample and then generate some in incoherent magnum could be a this way is to, to me it. yeah this is to me probably the uh, the trivial one but uh, I think it's worth uh, more uh, study uh, to see. understand whether this is due to magma magna right the incoherent I mean the thermalization process. So that actually basically is sort of, uh, you transfer the coherent procession mode to incoherent magna. So that the second process is, I think is more interesting from a physics point of view, but we don't have much more um, experimental data to support either one. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, the second question will be asked by uh, Rolando. Please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead with the question. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is how much power was used on this 240 gigahertz source? Yeah. And the second question is uh, related to the previous one, actually. So in this picture of coherent to coherent magna mm. transformation, uh, so is, is it effectively you're saying that the 240 gigahertz source is heating up the material and therefore producing more incoherent magnons? Is that a picture that's consistent with this? And if that's the case, uh, so would a test just be reducing the power of the 240 gigahertz source to see if that change in helicity changes the temperature at which that happens? Yeah. Okay, let me ask the second question first. So essentially, uh, in our paper, actually, we also have uh, in, the, in the supplemental part, so we actually directly detect the temperature rise using the thermometry, the resistive thermometry, essentially using platinum and the tantalum itself. So we see, the, in the case of the platinum, we see the temperature rise I mean, that we see a resistance rise at the resonance, which has exactly the same shape as the resonance, the um, inverse spin hall voltage resonance. And in the case of the platinum, because uh, it has a different uh, slope, so actually resistance decrease, uh, but it has the same line shape as the resonance, like Lorentzian line shape. So we extracted, we, we could uh, calibrate, right? We extracted temperature difference I think that the number uh, we quoted actually uh, is in the uh, in the paper. I, I, if I remember correctly, is a fraction of a, a degree. So there is a temperature rise. So the question, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think a more interesting question is, we cannot uh, we can distinguish two, but more interesting question is this coherent incoherent magna. We I like to um, to hear more uh, from theoretical uh, colleagues see whether. Uh, such a process is indeed in, important. But uh, the, the one trivial uh, experimental, I mean, one trivial mechanism would be the heating as we observe from the experimental uh, uh, experiments. So we, we indeed have the temperature detection, which shows the temperature rise. Yeah. Uh, oh, what, sorry, what was the first uh, question again? 
how much power is there in oh, power, the yeah. 40 gigahertz ones? Yeah. So, so for most of the data, we use a maximum power, which is a 50, uh, about a 55 milliwatts or so. Yeah, we also have a different power data for a different power. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Rolando, have a follow up question? Yeah, so I, I, I do. Uh, oh, hold on. Okay, then oh, uh, we, we can have a uh, Yanko, please go ahead with your question and we'll come back to Rolando later. Uh, Hi, Hi, I'm not on video, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, I, I, it's not so much of a question rather than a c comment of satisfaction in a way mm -hmm. about the scaling analysis you did. Uh -huh. uh, the, the point of satisfaction is that way too often people grab some substance or other and they, they, they measure things that they read they should measure and then they do some of the standards analyses from the 60s and 70s, the great days of phase transitions and critical phenomena. And let's say they'll pick the added NOx plot or plots if they have, it, it's actually many plots. And then from them, uh, the trick is always, it's extremely difficult to determine the scaling behavior. And the problem begins with the exact determination of the critical temperature because that's what, what's in your scale variable tau, right? And then it scales all everything else. So uh, I don't want to go into the exposition of the Arnold Nox plot. It's just that I rather liked that instead, uh, I think you picked what you thought is the theoretically relevant model, the 3D Ising. Now, I can't say uh, offhand whether <laughs> it is so or not, but that's what you found consistent with what you had. Otherwise, you, you'll get to do your, your measurements. And uh, again, like, unfortunately, way too many people are just producing scaling uh, measurements. And yeah. so, uh, again, that's my point of satisfaction that you opted for theoretical underpinning rather, rather than yeah. If, you, if you get obsessed with scaling of your yeah. substance, most probably you'll end up by claiming that it belongs to a new universality class. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And uh, that's what no one wants. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Very, uh, I'm with you. Uh, I actually, my first uh, PhD project was this YPCO, this critical scaling. So I, I remember all those uh, analysis, um, which I did uh, decades ago. Um, so one thing I just want to comment is, okay, so you have some rough ideas, 3D, XY, or Ising, right? So mean field versus critical. Um, you have some ideas. So question is, okay, for us, you're absolutely right. If you choose TC slightly differently, it can change things, right? The very nice scaling can be very poor, right? So the question rather, uh, is here, for example, if we choose, let's say, 3D Ising, the exponents, can we, can we have uh, TC in a reasonable range? Um, so in a reasonable range uh, of determination of your TC, uh, does, it, uh, does it look bad, scaling look very bad so that we cannot even uh, can not even show the, you know, the collapse of the curves, right? So the question is, we do this to every um, assumption, right? So every model, we do this. So we found relatively that speaking, right? Compared by every, you know, the possible scenario, then we find uh, this is the best model. So this is how uh, we, we, uh, we found the 3D Ising that uh, works. So you're absolutely right. So you can, once, if, if you're not careful, you can arrive at very erroneous <laughs> conclusion regarding those uh, exponents or new universality class. So I also agree, this is sort of self-consistent check. Uh, it, it does not really have the huge um, power to predict anything, but this is sort of, yeah, use your, your word maybe is just a sense of satisfaction, so so um, uh, a self-consistent check. Uh, yeah, I uh, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, Rolando, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, so I was gonna ask if uh, if the signal, the inverse spin hole voltage is proportional to the power yeah. of the source. Right. Oh, uh, yes, it is. So we, add, in fact, uh, we, we have that data, we did not uh, include it in the, in the paper, but uh, it is uh, uh, linear, uh, is directly proportional to the, to the power, yes. Okay, so we're gonna go to, we have uh, two questions on Twitch, so I'm gonna read that. In the meantime, if you have questions in Zoom, you can raise hand now, you don't have to wait for me to, to finish and you can keep the hands raised so I can see that uh, when I come back. Um, the first question is, uh, uh, the antiferromagnetic materials uh, work, uh, you should demonstrate the work at a high field and low temperature. Uh, is there any chance to integrate it into a real device on a CMOS circuit? And uh, can you comment on synthetic antiferromagnetic materials? At least we have more chance to use in a real device. Good questions. So I should answer them now, right? Yeah, if you can. Okay, so of course, and that's, you know, the device application is sort of the next or ultimate, right? So, so the next question is, well, I did, I forgot to say that we actually started with uh, relatively uh, thick, good quality, well-defined, or I'm a well-characterized uh, single crystal material. Um, so the real application requires uh, thin films, right? So when you do lithography, make devices, you really need to work on, you need to have those effects to work uh, um, on thin film devices. Um, then the, um, we, we haven't done that yet, right? Although we, we are able to make high quality thin films, antiferromagnetic thin films, we, we are in the process of doing it. But um, by my, my feeling, this is my, my feeling, right? I'm quite confident that this inverse spin hole detection should work because as long as you have reasonably thick AFM films, it doesn't require much, you know, too thick, I mean, tens of nanometers should be enough, right? To have antiferromagnetic properties. Then the detection principle here is the inverse spin hole. It does not need a volume, right? It needs spin current, right? Spin current from the surface, from the interface. Okay, so so in principle, I think it should work, but it needs to be directly demonstrated. Uh, the second part of the synthetic, I think it, it should, but the, the uh, resonance um, condition is completely different, right? So so probably one can either do this with, uh, with a low flow frequency so um, yeah, so that can be tried, I think, right? If I have a sample, I would do it. <laughs> sure, thank you. And the second question from Twitter is, uh, um, in the elementary introductions to antiferromagnetic magnets, the thermodynamic boundary between the antiferromagnetic material and the spin flop phases is in general different from limit of stability of the AFM magnets. Can you comment on the thermodynamic boundary of the AFM uh, phase in your samples? So spin flop phase, uh, in the, the repeatability or stability of the phase boundary, is that a? Uh, the stability. A stability, okay. So yes, uh, indeed, um, I don't think, uh, Okay, I don't think we have a complete uh, good understanding. Uh, so near the um, critical point, critical field, I think that, um, there has to be, uh, theoretically, there's a sharp, right, there, oh, here. There's a sharp drop here, right? So it's the two branch immediately becomes one. So in reality, this never happens. So, and also the, I mean, domains, right? There are, you know, other like a spin flop domains. Uh, I think in reality, there must be um, such a thing, uh, insta um, uh, instability uh, and multi-phases. But uh, however, uh, I will say we don't have a good understanding, but I will say 
uh, we did observe the spin flop resonance feature here. So we attempt to explain that by, by this type of uh, uh, domains, by some coexistence of some domains. Uh, so I think in reality it must be there, but we don't have a good understanding. Uh, we don't have enough data and good understanding of it. Probably some kind of atomistic uh, uh, spin dynamic simulation uh, would help, um, but uh, we don't have such cap capability yet. Yeah.